The Nigeria police yesterday began strict enforcement of the nationwide curfew and interstate travel ban that was imposed by President Muhammadu Buhari two weeks ago. The police commands, particularly in Lagos and Ogun states, as well as the federal capital territory, acting on the directive of the Inspector General of Police, Mr. Mohamed Adamu, locked down their areas of operation from 8 p.m., insisting that there was no exemption for anybody, including essential workers. The president had, with effect from May 4th, relaxed the lockdown on the FCT Lagos and Ogun states that he had imposed on March 30th, in placing a nationwide curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. and a ban on interstate travel. He, however, maintained that the exemption of essential workers, including health workers and journalists, as well as the movement of food, medicines and other essential services. However, state governors and the presidential task force on COVID-19 complained that security agencies were not enforcing the guidelines effectively, which was leading to a rampant disobedience by citizens. Now, based on this, police boss Adamu had a uh, teleconference with the top brass of the force and directed strict enforcement of the restrictions, rescinding the pass that was given to journalists and health workers to operate beyond 8 p.m., warning that anyone, including ministers that are found on the roads during the curfew would be arrested and prosecuted. But in a statement yesterday, the force public relations officer, Frank Mba, rescinded on the non-exemption directive and restored the privilege of essential workers, including medical personnel, firefighters, ambulance services, journalists, etc., to move during the curfew. Meanwhile, the virus infection tally increased yesterday by 226 to 6,401 confirmed cases. We now have 1,734 people discharged, while unfortunately 192 have lost their lives. The new cases were reported as follows in 16 states, including Lagos having 131 new cases, Ogun State having 25 new cases, Plateau State having 15 new cases, Edo 11, Kaduna 7, Oyo 6, the FCT 5, Adamawa 5, Jigawa, Eboni and Borno 4, Nasarawa 3, Bauchi and Gombe 2, Enugu 1 and Bayelsa also 1. So there we have the latest figures, doctors, with regards to coronavirus. Over to you. Well, uh, quickly, I think the, the uh, story about the police, the Inspector General of Police having uh, a teleconference with uh, divisional uh, assistant inspector generals and then directing that nobody should be exempted mm. uh, from the uh, curfew uh, from 8 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m. as it were. I think that's something that is very disturbing. Yeah. The only uh, good side of it is that yesterday evening he ended up reversing himself and journalists who had been arrested in Lagos and in Abuja other essential workers, including doctors and nurses, yeah. who were reporting, uh, who were returning from work and were arrested by the police, uh, were eventually released. So that's the good part of it, that at the end of the day, common sense prevailed. Yes. Because at every occasion when the president addressed the country and imposed the curfew or talked about the restriction of movement, on March 29, the first time that the president addressed the country, he talked about exemptions. Mm. And that exemption... Uh, covered media workers, journalists, mm. persons working in the uh, petroleum, oil and gas industry yeah. who were involved in the distribution of uh, petroleum, um, health workers, people in the pharmaceutical industry, security personnel, you know, and in other words, persons categorized as essential workers. Yeah. And that had been observed up till uh, yesterday when we were told that the Inspector General of Police said there will be no exemption. Mm. Uh, subjecting health workers, doctors, you know, nurses, and other categories of uh, workers uh, in that uh, health sector, and also journalists, uh, to the humiliation that many of them suffered uh, last night. Mm. I think that the Inspector General of Police personally owes all these essential workers an apology. An apology. Yeah. And we will expect that apology to be offered. It is not enough for the police to say, Oh, uh, is the police uh, that has been blamed uh, for not enforcing the lockdown? Now, we want to uh, think that, you know, the uh, police hierarchy does not act on the basis of emotion. Mm. Because that, in my view, would seem to be an emotional response. Mm -hmm. It would seem to be a classic case of eye service. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, the ordinary Nigerian will interpret it as follows. That if you say we are not working, okay, we will show you that we can work. Because what you're essentially saying is that... 
you, you basically, as the police force, don't know how to enforce the lockdown with the common sense that just applies to it. You don't know how to m ensure that it, it, essential workers are not affected. And that means that you can't really perform your line of duty. That's essentially what you're saying. I don't see why that is so hard. What makes it worse is that it's, it, it should be interpreted as an act of sabotage. Absolutely. Because when the federal government said essential workers should be on the road, it is to keep the machinery of state going. Yeah. Uh, doctors, nurses that you have detained because they are not on the road. Suppose there was an emergency, they will not be able to intervene. Uh, uh, journalists that you have uh, disrupted their pattern of work, then it means you are also obstructing the flow of information. Absolutely. Because many of these journalists, some work overnight. To get some you the work, morning news. Some will have finished reading news by 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Some will even go to work by 10 p.m to go and uh, read the 10 o'clock news, and then the police will constitute itself into a, a sabotage institution. Three, I think what the uh, Inspector General of Police uh, did yesterday also deserves in getting a query from the president, because it was an act of, uh, it was an act of affront and, and disrespect mm -hmm. to the president. The Inspector General of Police is not in a position to vary the directive of the president of Nigeria, and is guilty, in my view, of insubordination. But like you said, I think it's very good that they did rescind on this non-exemption, at least, so that we did not wake up to know that this was still the news. Now, let's move on to another news headline. The Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Hanuri, has linked most of the COVID-19 deaths that have been recorded in Nigeria to self-medication and delayed reports of cases to treatment centers. Now, he told reporters yesterday in Abuja during the media briefing by the presidential task force that Nigerians should be prepared for both the best or the worst outcomes in the days ahead. He said that whatever the progress that would be recorded it or lack of it would depend on the level of compliance with safety measures and health advisories outlined by the authorities. Ehani Ray noted that there had been a disturbing picture emerging, whereby many of the casualties were drawn from well-to-do persons who choose to remain at home to receive treatments until their cases became worse. Meanwhile, he advised infected persons not to delay action, but to seek immediate action and medical attention. Meanwhile, the virus infection tally, actually, I'll stop there. We have already spoken about the tally increasing by 200, uh, 226 new cases. Now, this is extremely worrying. Uh, this news that came out yesterday, doctor, that the majority of deaths that we've seen so far are linked to self-medication. And this is what we were speaking about yesterday when we were warning, in fact, the day before again, um, as well, warning against advising people to use certain medications such as hydroxychloroquine, etc., when it has not been approved by our public health authorities. Over to you. The position of the World Health Organization and also the Presidential Task Force and the Ministry of Health is that, look, whatever drug that anybody wants to use, should be based on doctor's prescription. Yeah. Self-medication is a form of a suicide attempt, uh, people trying to kill themselves. But as you pointed out, uh, it is uh, something to worry about because when political figures, uh, power figures, persons of influence, uh, like uh, President Donald Trump of the United States, or the governor of Bauchi State in Nigeria, or the governor of your state in Nigeria, go public. Uh, to uh, tell people, oh, this is what I used in my own case, so you too can use it, in other words. So that's, uh, uh, it's, it's not enough for the uh, Minister of Health to say people should not self-medicate. He should also insist that persons who have been treated, as he did before, he should continue to do so, mm. should not come and turn themselves into scientists. Yeah. Governors should not prescribe uh, medication for COVID-19. People should only talk about what they know. They should stop talking about what they do not know. The minister also pointed out yesterday that there are all kinds of brands of sanitizers mm. out there and that people should always make sure that the sanitizer that they buy has a NAVDAC medication. Yes. Otherwise, you can have people, you know, using sanitizers that have not been approved and thinking that they are protecting like the uh, study in themselves. Abuja. Yes. Mm. So these, these are the uh, issues. But the good news, of course, that came yesterday from the... Uh, minister and the NCDC uh, mm. Director General, is that the federal government is training uh, up to about 12,000 12, health workers. Yes. And I think that that is good news. It should not just be about training, it should also be about retraining. And Absolutely. this must be a continuous, sustainable exercise. Couldn't have said it better, Doctor. That is all on the news headlines. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, our trio, Rota Zadiri, Michael Wilson, and Aaron Akerajala, will be here to give us updates on Africa and global business and, of course, COVID-19. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Rutu Sodiri, Arise News business analyst, is here with business updates. Good morning. Good How are you morning, both doing? Good, Good morning. How are you? So um, the, we're talking healthcare, and uh, you know, after seeing uh, Defemi Akinsoya's uh, special report on uh, Reddington Hospital yesterday, um, it got me thinking that Nigeria is sitting on an absolute gold mine with regards to medical tourism. And uh, I looked at a report. There was a um, healthcare summit that was supposed to take place. But before we even get there, look at so look at this. This was the particular part. Uh, that jumped out, the technology that was used in analyzing the parts of the heart that were blocked and then the bypass surgery that then took place. You can scale this across this country and bring in billions in foreign exchange for Nigeria. That is vitally, vitally needed. India's market to test case here, mm -hmm. they are set to get $9 billion uh, attributed to medical tourism coming into their country for 2020. There was a healthcare summit that was supposed to take place uh, in November of uh, 2019. Yeah, Advantage Healthcare India. Before this summit took place, well, it took place from the 13th to the 15th. There was a report that was put together by the FICCI, India's uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, the Federal Federation of India Chamber of Commerce and Industry, along with Ernst and Young, yeah. and they looked at a number of data points. Look at the foreign tourist arrivals in India from 2014 to 2017. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a 55 percent annual growth rate. 2017, we have almost 500,000 people coming in uh, uh, into India. This map particularly tells you the biggest countries that are the sources of MVT, medical value travel. Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, Brazil, India. Look at Africa. Africa is completely Nada. black. Now, if no, one should, I think we're moving a little too fast here. If we go back there, Africa is blank, but nobody should be confused into thinking that no medical tourism goes into Africa. It's just that I think Ghana, South Africa, some people travel there for medical tourism. The thing is, the numbers in absolute terms are nowhere near the biggest countries. So if you go to the next map and flip it, these are the source countries. These are the countries that provide India, Canada, and elsewhere with the source of medical value travel. You'll notice, you see Nigeria in green. Right in green. Yeah, in Sudan. The green legend is particularly for this India. That is where India gets here. So, so Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and then you go into the Middle East, Oman, Yemen, and Nigeria, of course. Now, the thing is, as they, as even with the numbers coming from Nigeria, Nigeria does not make the top 10 countries. As With all the money we spend going into India, we don't make the top 10 countries of where India gets their medical value tourism. You can see them, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Oman, Iraq, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya. So more, apparently Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya, more people from there go into India for medical value tourism. This is what people are looking for. Quality of healthcare, accreditation, savings in medical treatment, ease in the process of obtaining a visa, medical visa, connectivity, tourism, and then regulations and institutional arrangements. That's what they're looking for. That's what India has, and that's why people keep um, going into the country. Now, this is key here. Yeah. If you look at India, India out of 41 medical tourism centers, India makes into the top four. So Brazil is top, Canada, Costa Rica, India. Savings with respect to the US, the last column to your right, we we'll have to go back there again. Savings with, regard, with respect to the U.S., you're looking at one-tenth of the cost of your health care in India mm -hmm. versus um, uh, the United States. But one of the biggest stats that jumped out of me, there was another forum that was supposed to take place. This was by Informa Markets. This, was supposed to, if this forum, medical forum, was supposed to happen in April of this year. It was canceled because of the coronavirus. Informa Markets put out this particular stats. India's health care center... The healthcare sector is supposed to be worth $372 billion by 2022. They are projected to spend about $200 billion uh, on medical, actually, actually be $200 million, actually, million on medical infrastructure by 2024. But look at that. The last point, India imports nearly 80% of their medical devices, despite all the money that comes in from medical They've services. built an entire health city, Narayana Health City, to right. make healthcare affordable for people, mainly for heart surgeries. Which, Brilliant. Thank you. And the thing is, even though they import 80% mm -hmm. of their medical devices, it is the cost of those imports are offset by the revenue that they bring in for medical. So yeah. the thing is, this is Nigeria's market. Nigeria should be a top destination based Thank on you. what we saw in Redison Hospital yesterday. Yeah. Well, three, if you scale it, three this is where well. well. right. The India example is good, but mm. you know, in the age of globalization, you cannot stop medical value tourism. Consumers will go to where they think they can get quality. Mm. So the challenge is for countries and governments to develop quality in their own environment. Mm. India makes over $3 billion per annum just from medical value tourism, right. because the government of India mm -hmm. takes the health sector seriously. So if Nigeria must become a destination for medical value tourism, government has 
a major role to so play. Like, Second, government, the government of Nigeria also has to worry about medical trafficking as different from medical value travel. Mm. For some people, it's big business, yes. and it's about perception. They downgrade Nigeria, and they say, oh, India is the best destination for you to go. Mm. So medical tourism has become part of soft power diplomacy for certain countries. Three, is there a need for legislation? Legislation in this respect will be not against medical value tourism, which I say mm. you cannot check in mm. the age of globalization. If people have money, they will look for quality. Right. You know. Then four, um, it's about developing the infrastructure in your own country. Yeah, to fill there is low activity voice. in Nigeria because mm. we don't have the infrastructure. Our institutions yeah. are not functioning well. Even the talents that we have have been taken away by brain drain. Right. Now, the lesson of COVID-19, and perhaps the example of Reddit in hospital, is that government needs to invest more in, in the healthcare the sector exactly. and raise the level. And we can get there. Certainly. Well, thank you very Aaron. much, Rotus. I nearly called you Aaron. Rotus, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. We'll thank see you, so you tomorrow. Much. Moving on now for a more global business update, Michael Wilson joins us from London. Good morning, Michael. How are you today? Good morning. Fine, thank you. Good morning, morning Michael. Yes. If I need any cosmetic surgery, uh, I'll be straight across to Nigeria. Um, right, let's talk about Asian stocks, first of all. And, uh, well, the, the, the vaccine rally ran out. The company is rather interesting. This Moderna we were talking about yesterday, the, the, the idea that they might have a vaccine that actually um, helps get rid of COVID-9, uh, COVID-A, um, is, is something that uh, actually seized the markets quite hugely yesterday, as, as I explained. In fact, what's happened is that on closer examination, it turns out the Moderna sample was actually quite small and people are actually questioning the efficacy of the drug in the first place. There is cynics would say that Moderna used the rise in the share price to um, increase their own, uh, their, their own share price itself and then sell shares to make a profit. Now, nothing wrong with that, but there's certainly questions to be asked about talking up your own product um, at the expense of the truth. Again, uh, this is what the cynics are saying right now. Both the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 uh, ended red in the red yesterday. Interesting as far as the UK is concerned, there's a big story about a recession. I'll come on to that in a second. But first of all, the FTSE 250, which is much more UK-based, actually showed quite a good recovery yesterday. Now, on to the UK Chancellor, who's been saying that COVID will cause a recession, the like of which has never, ever been seen before. And um, we were talking at the end of last week as to whether there was going to be a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery, the U-shaped one having that rather longer shape down here. And the question is, where is that going to be? I've got two suggestions for that. First of all, it could well be that manufacturing comes out of things fairly quickly. But we are, or Europe and also the UK, particularly strong on service sectors. And because of social distancing, I'm talking about things like restaurants, hotels, and the rest of it, catering and so on. And that is going to really suffer with social distancing. So that might be the, the U-shape. The Chancellor went on even further. This is on the back of jobless claims totaling 2 million in the UK. It's not unemployment, jobless claims. Unemployment is probably much bigger than that. Talking about permanent damage to the economy. Yesterday's story I was telling you about this recovery fund that's being proposed for the EU from Germany and yeah, France. Looking at that detail slightly more, you do get the idea that this is kind of sidelining the European Central Bank. European Central Bank, if you remember, is the one that's taken quantitative easing further and further and further. In other words, they're buying debt. This is a grant which is being proposed from EU funds by France and Germany. Are they actually wanting to... Um, get out of the way of the European Central Bank and sideline it. Generally speaking, corporate EU does not look very healthy. Average profits expected to be down 48 to 50 percent um, in the second quarter. Oil demand, here's a quick one for you. Yes, we talked about the oil price, opening of economies, sparking demand and the rest of it. China up to pre-pandemic levels. However, Reuters is reporting this morning that General Motors is almost there, on, dis as they describe it, on developing an electric car battery. They're calling it the a million mile battery. Um, now, will that happen? What effect on the oil price will that have of you? Michael, thank you very much for these updates, which we had some more time to discuss. But moving on now for updates with regards to COVID-19 uh, today, Aaron Akewajala is here in the studio. Good morning, Aaron. How are you? Hey, good morning. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Until this morning.
Now let's get straight into it. And the UN Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, has actually had some very, very high praises for Africa and how they've actually handled the whole COVID-19 pandemic. And he says world leaders should take a cue from Africa and how they've actually handled it, that the preventive measures and proactive measures taken has actually helped stem the virus. Because, of course, reports that actually came, statistics and also projections were quite, a, were quite grim, grim, rather, looking at how things actually play out. But when you look at the figures as of today, he says that after everything that were, was projected initially, we just have 2,834 deaths in Africa as we speak. We'll get to see some of the figures on the board in a moment. But at the moment, 88,172. I see the number of confirmed cases. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on our Ice News. Aaron Akarej is still with us with COVID-19 update. Sorry, Aaron, that was... Uh, yeah, okay. We have to take a quick commercial break. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so before, you were giving a report about what Antonio Guterres, Guterres is saying. Of course, Secretary. yes, he's been extolling African leaders for their proactiveness in this whole pandemic and how they've actually handled it. And that's why he says that when you look at the number, the figures right now in Africa, the number of deaths recorded it's below 3,000, 2,834, to be very, very precise. And when you look at it side by side with the fact that 323,345 number um, cases have been recorded talking about death. So when you look at that, he says that African leaders should be applauded heavily, although he still states that a lot should still be done for Africa and investment should still be made to Africa in terms of fighting COVID-19. Because if we end COVID-19 in Africa, it's almost like saying that COVID-19 will be ending across the world. So that is his own perspective towards it. And African leaders... I don't understand that this. perspective, though. If you end COVID-19 in Africa, you'd be ending COVID-19 across the rest of the world. COVID-19 didn't start in Africa, and Africa has seen the least of an impact from the virus. So I, I don't understand that perspective. Is that correct? Well, I think what we should say <laughs> yeah. is that the U.S. Secretary General... Uh, we should take his comment as a word of encouragement yeah. uh, for African countries yeah. to do a lot more. Because you know that Africa is said to be the last frontier, the last frontier in everything, good and bad. True. You know, and with regard to COVID-19, there have been apocalyptic uh, predictions about what will happen in Africa. The same kind of apocalyptic predictions that we had when we had the Ebola outbreak. But at the end of the day, Africa uh, seems to be recording the lowest number of uh, uh, casualties. Yeah. That is on a relative uh, basis. But while African countries should take this as a word of encouragement, uh, their leaders should also realize that, look, they need to do a lot more in terms of testing in mm. particular, because the question could be, are we doing enough testing yeah. in Africa? We need to strengthen infrastructure, and we need to be more forward-looking. And the UN Secretary General is absolutely correct when he says Africa needs help, particularly with regard to debt obligations. Yes, it is. And it's good to see the Bretton Woods institutions and China, most recently, talking Putting about some relief on uh, delay of payments, uh, debt relief, as the IMF did in April for 25 countries, 19 of which uh, were taken from Africa. Absolutely. Yeah. Encouraging well, news for Africa this morning. Yeah, definitely. quite encouraging, I must actually say. <laughs> definitely. Thank you Aaron, very much. Thank you All very right, much. Aaron. Pleasure.